Now, Father God, we are so grateful for this morning. We are grateful and thankful for the truth that we sing there, that we can abide in you forever, that under your wings we are sheltered and safe. And, and Father, we face all sorts of trials, physical trials, those that would threaten our lives, also trials of the heart and the soul. Uh, Father, there's so many things that we face in this life because this is a sinful and broken world that caused difficulty for us. And yet we know that no matter what happens, even with our very lives, that those of us who have trusted in Christ as Savior are sheltered under your wing, uh, that uh, we can know firmly that that question that's asked there, who from your love can sever, we, we cannot be taken away from that. That love cannot be be removed from our lives, even if we seem to reject it at times, even when we become angry with you, Lord, even when we have doubts. For those of us who have truly trusted in Christ, that love is ever abiding. It, it never leaves us. You never forsake us. And Father, we are so grateful to know that we can face the trials of this day, knowing that we are secure in Christ that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and sealing us into that day of redemption. But Father, we can face all things with confidence, with courage, with comfort, with hope, because of your love that never fails. Father, we thank you for this love. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us to show us that love. We thank you for these things in his name. Amen. For our scripture reading this morning, we turn to that great and wonderful epistle of Paul, Romans. And we'll turn to chapter 8 this morning in Romans. Romans chapter 8. And I'd like to start in verse 12 this morning. Uh, this is, uh, of course, if you heard me say uh, before, one of the greatest, most wonderful chapters in all of scripture. Romans chapter 8. We start in verse 12 this morning. He says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. The hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with it, with patience. Let us pray. Uh, Father God, we see in this text so many wonderful and profound truths that we could dwell on and should dwell on for a long time, meditate on. Lord, I want to, from this text, just thank you to show appreciation that you through your word acknowledge the pains of this world that creation itself is experiencing, but also that we experience 
as your image bearers, as your caretakers of this creation. Father, there is, there is so much pain in this world because of sin that you allow to continue. By your grace and your mercy and your love, you allow these things to continue that you ultimately might be glorified, that we, that we through our trials and our tribulations might be more and more like Christ in this world to shine a brighter light to the people that they might come to know you, that you would be glorified and that you would also be loved by those people who now in this moment hate you most those who are lost in their transgressions and sin, who are walking in darkness. And Father, I thank you for our missionaries throughout the world, especially those that are going into the dark, the darkest places, those that are living in dangerous places as this world becomes more and more hostile to Christians, to believers. Father, sometimes we... we have a difficult time seeing this, but we can see through history that from the very beginnings of the Christian faith, your people were persecuted, and that persecution has only increased. It has only ever increased. And so, Lord, we do not expect that to lighten. We expect to continue as believers into this dark world to be ambassadors, to be ministers of light and truth and beauty. In these places. So again, we thank you for the missionaries, those in the dark and dreadful places. Father, we just pray that you would give your hand of protection over them, that you would shelter them under your wing, that you would is something that cannot be taken away from them despite the trials they face. I thank you specifically and pray specifically for the Menors in Paraguay who have asked for prayer for a potential prison ministry that is uh, opening up to them. Uh, to, to reach uh, some of the prisoners there in Paraguay. And, and Father, we pray that you would continue to bless them and provide for them those opportunities to serve. We thank you for the prison ministries that are happening here in the United States, uh, the Prison Mission Association, and all those working to bring the gospel uh, to those men and women who uh, are being locked away, who are being hopefully rehabilitated, but at the very least have have to be removed from our society for the safety of our, our nation, our people. But Father, we pray that you would work miracles in those prisons as we've seen you do over and over again with people who, when they have the time to sit and reflect, to ponder their sin, they eventually turn to you and understand that they need salvation. They need freedom in their life, not just in this life, though, but in eternity. And so, Father, we pray for all these missions, these missionaries, these programs seeking to help those lost in the darkness. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just in a way of announcements, a couple of things to mention, the dates coming up. We have a board meeting via Zoom, via uh, Internet, uh, coming up a plan for October 16th. Again, if you have anything you'd like to bring to our attention, uh, please let us know. If you'd like to join, we can certainly help you do that. Another date coming up in October is the 31st. Uh, that is the Sunday we'll meet where we're, uh, we're giving towards the GGF uh, fund, uh, which we do on an occasional uh, fifth Sundays of the month. Uh, I wanted to mention that specifically because there was a change in the GGF leadership that some of you might not be aware of. Uh, that is something I should have mentioned before, but simply uh, slipped my mind. So uh, the Grace Gospel Fellowship, the National Council, have decided to uh, install Brian Walker as the president of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. And Matt Amundsen, who was the executive director, uh, has transitioned into the vice president role and done so uh, pretty willingly. I don't personally know Brian Walker. I tried to find some information on him. Uh, not somebody I've met before, but he seems like somebody who has a lot of experience in, in leadership, a uh, real sort of uh, vision casting and some of the administrational uh, gifts that are required for uh, leading an organization like the Grace Gospel Fellowship. Uh, so I'm pretty excited uh, for this change. Uh, I don't know if the if Grace Gospel Fellowship has had vice presidents before. Uh, some of you have been around longer than I can maybe uh, let me know if that's the case. But uh, this is the first time I've seen sort of a dual leadership role in the GGF, and I'm pretty excited about that uh, because that is a job that, uh, as we've seen, one man cannot do. It's an impossible job, uh, really, to lead the GGF. Uh, because there's those 
administrational leadership needs, but there's also the role that that person always comes into, which is caring for pastors, being sort of like a bishop over the Grace Churches uh, and caring and loving pastors. Um, that was uh, that was what was so good in my experience with Frosty Hansen, who was the real first president I got to know. Uh, his love for people was just astonishing. And um, I know I think when Matt Amundsen was made executive director, the goal was to have somebody who would be more of that sort of administrational leader. Uh, and he ended up spending most of his time just caring for pastors uh, and loving pastors, which is required, it's something we pastors need. Uh, and so I think this will allow him to continue doing that, which is something he's sort of grown into and fallen in love with, and allow uh, Mr. Walker, or President Walker, I suppose, to uh, do some of those. So just wanted to make you aware of those uh, changes. Uh, Brian Walker has been acting as uh, president of the GGF since September 7th. So uh, we actually were informed of this, I think, on September 8th or 9th. So. Uh, I'm a little behind in the announcement, but wanted to let you guys know that. So uh, that's all really I have. So we'll continue with some music and then singing together again before the message. Last week, we met the Judaizers, the party of circumcision, those Jewish Christian legalists that thought that all the Gentiles should adopt the practices and the ways of the Jewish people in order to be saved by the Jewish Messiah. And we saw how we can really start to understand their position. We reflected on the fact that the Jewish people were raised and commanded by God to perform certain rituals, various signs of their faith, to adhere to a firm morality, to make sacrifices of flesh, which included animal sacrifices, but also circumcision. And those were all signs of God's covenant and his salvation, or specifically that they as a people and them as individuals opted in to that covenant, were members of that covenant that God had made. And along comes Paul, one of the Pharisees who has come to Jesus and he's claiming to be presenting the teachings of the Jewish Messiah and saying that Gentiles ought not bother with all of that law stuff, except for a selection of some of the moral laws. And, and even Paul himself doesn't share or repeat all of the moral law that's given. Not even all Ten Commandments are given. And so this Paul becomes this strange figure. And that doesn't seem to sit right, what Paul is teaching with someone whose entire life is defined by these things, defined by the one true God. Because the right in that their way of life, at least, was originally prescribed by God. They had changed it a bit and twisted it a bit, but it was prescribed by God. And so how could the same God not have the same expectations of Israel for his chosen people. And that could only make sense if being his chosen people wasn't just a matter of blessing, but it was also a great burden and a great responsibility. You know, fundamental to the misunderstanding of the Judaizers is the nature of salvation. And that is the fundamental misunderstanding, as we mentioned last week or looked at last week, of so many cults and uh, so many theologically misguided churches. You see, the Judaizers thought that circumcision and the law and the rituals were all a part of salvation. But those had never been a matter of salvation. And yet, as we saw, these Judaizers were teaching other Christians that they cannot be saved unless they are circumcised, unless they follow the law of Moses. Well, if they think that's true of Gentiles, then certainly they thought that was true of them. They began to think even of themselves as people who must do these works to be saved. But it's not. It's not true of the Jews. It's not true of the Gentiles. It's not true even of these Judaizers. Because all of them are saved by grace alone. Old Testament or New Testament or anything you might consider in between those two, every person in those places in those times, is saved by grace alone. Circumcision 
and uncircumcision, as we saw last week, are nothing, really, in the eyes of God, at least when it comes to salvation. They mean nothing in that regard. And yet, despite the weakness in their theology, the theology of these Judaizers, or the theology of so many uh, professed Christians today, despite the weakness of the theology, they're not weak in terms of fervor or passion or zeal, especially these Judaizers. And because of that, because of their passion, because of their commitment to what they thought was right, and because they clearly were not right, there's a division that's formed. There's dissension. And we mentioned that dissension last week. But that dissension leads to discussion. And so I want to reread our text from last week here in Acts chapter 15. We'll start in verse 1, and then we'll jump right into the matter of the discussion that takes place after this. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, remember, Paul and Barnabas are still, uh, still in Antioch at this time. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of, some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Verse 3, so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. After their difficulty in Antioch dealing with these Judaizers, Paul and Barnabas, they traveled up to Jerusalem, so up the mountain to Jerusalem, where they're able to recount in great detail the work that God had done through them in Galatia. And now we see the discussion begins. And we don't have many details of the discussion. Luke, the author of Acts, this historical account, doesn't give detailed minutes for the meeting, but we do get some of the highlights. Look with me at verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. Now, here they had a conflict. Paul and Barnabas came down and said, People, you, you won't believe what God did by, by grace through faith plus nothing, is essentially the claim or what the Pharisees are hearing. And they recited everything that God had done with them. And, and they give God all of the glory. And as they're doing this, they're saying these things, the Pharisees shoot up and they, and they give this other side of the picture that they must be circumcised in order to be saved, and they must keep the whole law of Moses. And rather than have a public dispute, we see here that the apostles and the elders meet privately. And then they followed it with sort of a general session of sorts. Verse 7, And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. It's interesting here. It's, it's fitting. If you're following along and you're starting to understand this Peter character, as we've spent a lot of time with throughout the years, it's, it's fitting that Peter speaks up first. He's sort of the loudmouth one. He's usually the first one to speak, except for a few moments when he's He's really been humbled. His heart has really been sort of softened. And he's, he's always been this outspoken man, and, it, and he's one of these leaders of the Jewish Christian church here in Jerusalem. And so he speaks up. And now you're, you're beginning to see here what's forming is, is three sort of speeches that are given at this council. And again, I think we're only getting the highlights of these speeches. But the first one is Peter's, which we'll begin to look at in depth in a moment here. Then you get these claims by Paul and Barnabas. That's sort of the second of the speeches. And the third one is one by James. And all of these, all three of these speeches are in support of grace plus nothing. 
in this salvation discussion. And they lay down for us what I think is one of the most monumental passages proving that salvation is by grace through faith that we have anywhere in Scripture. Uh, some have called this the Magna Carta of the Christian Church. And so we, we should look here carefully, listen carefully, as we uh, first of all see Peter and what Peter had to say, and then we'll hear Paul and Barnabas, and then we'll move on to James after that. Uh, look ahead for a moment to verse 11, just to get sort of a preview here of Peter's view. Verse 11, Peter's talking here. He says, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. He says, but we believe. Now, Peter's not speaking for himself only. The elders and the apostles had to have this private conference, and out of that conference, out of that meeting, comes this statement where he says, But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will, just as the Gentiles will. How are you saved? It's by grace. That's the only thing that you see in there, grace which is God's free, unhindered, unhindered, undeserved favor. God saves purely apart from anything that you've ever done or ever will do. It is purely by grace. They don't need to keep the laws to be saved. Now that's Peter's great statement here. Now with that as the proclamation of these elders and apostles, they go about to prove that grace is all that is needed. And I want to give you what I think is the most weighty evidence anywhere in Scripture. Peter makes several points here, then Paul and Barnabas, and then James closes it off. The first proof that we have here that salvation is by grace is proven by past revelation. A look again at verse 7 as we see this proof of past revelation. Peter says, or it says, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and Peter says, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter saying, okay, let's look backwards for a moment. The issue here that we're discussing was settled like 10 years ago. Ten years ago, by the point we get to the Jerusalem Council, that Peter was there with Cornelius in his household. He's saying, you know that God by choice chose me to go to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. And they believed, and that's all that God asked. He's saying, God did not impose circumcision on them then. If you read the story, you look at it. Well, remember, Cornelius was a, a God-fearer. He's basically Jewish. He's done all of the things the law really asks of him, except be circumcised. And even in that moment, when he comes to, to faith, when he believes in Christ as Savior, God doesn't say, okay, now just go take care of that last thing you haven't done yet. He leaves him alone. He's saved by grace. So Peter says, point number one here, verifying salvation by grace is past revelation. The obvious point in question is, you know, have you now, have you people that he's talking to, have you come up with something new that God doesn't even require? Which, of course, is a horrible position to be in because that's, that makes you, that's the person making themselves greater than God and God second to them. If they're then imposing on people this work that God doesn't even ask people to do. He reminds them that the fundamental principle of salvation by faith has already been settled in the matter of Cornelius. That God didn't require circumcision then. God didn't ask him to be circumcised. And Peter, you see, is speaking from the standpoint of a Jew, and not only a Jew, but he's the one we consider the apostle to the Jews. And so if any of these, any of these apostles are going to side with the Judaizers, it's going to be one of them like Peter. So when Peter stands up, it's a shocking thing for these people, it really is, to have Peter side with Paul. And we think so much that Peter and Paul are in conflict. Sometimes we, we look at scriptures that seem to contradict the, themselves from the epistles of Peter and the epistles of Paul, but that's really not the case. There's no real point where, they, where scripture seems to contradict itself when you truly understand their points of view. Peter supports now Paul 
and Barnabas in the ministry to the Gentiles. He, in fact, is the first person to speak. He doesn't wait for anybody to say, okay, well, Peter, what do you think? He stands up right away and says, hey, this is how it is. And you know that because you know my story. You know what happened with me and Cornelius. So when Peter stands up, again, that's a, that's a shocking thing. Peter's identified with Judaism at its very heart. And he's the guy who stands up and says, you know, 10 years ago I was with Cornelius and he didn't have to do anything that you're asking these Gentiles to do. It was settled. It was done. It's pretty clear to Peter. If you were to go back to the 10th chapter and see the conversion of Cornelius, it simply says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Well, why? Why are they amazed? It's because here were these Gentiles being saved apart from circumcision. The old circumcision party was there 10 years ago when it happened, and God didn't ask for circumcision. And so proof number one that salvation is by grace is past revelation. These things that God has already shown. And maybe some of the same circumcision party standing in that place right there were there 10 years ago when Peter was with Cornelius. The second proof is quite a powerful one. And we saw a glimpse of it there in, uh, in Acts 10, that verse I just read to you. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 15, verses 8 and 9 now. Verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. I can sort of you can hang on to that thought here. Peter says the second proof that salvation is by grace through faith is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. Does God give his Holy Spirit to unbelievers? No, of course not. He gives the Holy Spirit only to those people who believe. We cannot even entertain the idea that, that maybe God did not know that whether or not they were real believers. Maybe God was thought they were truly believers, but he, he wasn't sure, or they really weren't believers. So Peter covers that with identifying God here as the one who knows the heart. There's other places in Scripture where it implies that we as people don't even know our own hearts. Not only that, but our hearts are, are wicked and depraved, the source of our sin. But we don't even know the heart, and yet God knows the heart. God knows who's real. He knows they're real, and they receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, the circumcision party was astonished just as I read when they did receive the Holy Spirit. It says, God who knows the heart bore witness. God gave testimony of the genuineness of their salvation by giving them the Holy Spirit. Do you know how God gives his testimony that you are truly saved? It's the same thing. He does that by giving you the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 14, we read it earlier, he says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. God gave testimony to Gentile salvation by faith alone, by grace alone. When he gave them, he granted them his spirit. And with that comes sealing. With that comes adoption. With that comes this opportunity then for these Gentiles and Jews alike to cry, Abba, Father. And with that spirit, we become co-heirs with Christ. 
we become heirs to what God has given all of humanity with Christ, with God. This, these Jewish people prided themselves as the one who were, ones who were going to inherit the land, the promised land of Israel. And they fail to recognize that as children of the Father, their inheritance becomes not just that promised land, which they've never been able to really occupy. It also includes all of creation itself. And it's not just for Israel, it's for Gentiles too. So God gives sal uh, testimony to Gentile salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, and granting his spirit. They hadn't kept the law. They hadn't done any of those things specifically. They were not circumcised. They didn't make any indication that they were part of God's covenant with Israel. The gift of the Spirit belongs to them, and the gift of the Spirit belongs only to those who are truly saved. Paul said to the Corinthians, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Why? Because you were bought with a price. In Romans 8, verse 9, it says this, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. To say that positively, anyone who does have the Spirit does belong to him. Galatians 3, 14, Paul says that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. There Paul says that the Spirit was given to Gentiles because their faith was all that was needed. Later in Galatians 4, 6, he says, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You see there, only true sons and daughters receive the Spirit. And the fact that they receive the Spirit means that they're a true child. There's no difference. In the 19th chapter of Acts, which we'll get to in some weeks, Paul ran into some interesting guys who were unaware of some things, and they didn't know exactly what was going on. And it says there in Acts 19, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, why do they not know about the Holy Spirit? The text goes on to say, and he, that is Paul, and he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. In other words, well, who are you guys anyway? And, and they say, well, we're, we're converts of John the Baptist. Well, no wonder they had received the Holy Spirit or heard of the Holy Spirit. You do not receive the Holy Spirit when you come into John the Baptist. And when Paul introduces them to Christ, immediately they were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body. And the Spirit came immediately when they believed in Jesus Christ for their salvation. There was no imposition of legalism on them at all. And the point was simply this. They were devout individuals. They believed the Old Testament. They believed in the message of John the Baptist that a Messiah was coming. But they never had the Holy Spirit. They never had the Holy Spirit because they never put their faith in Jesus of Nazareth. The minute they put their faith in the Messiah, in the Christ, they received the Holy Spirit. That's God's way of validating salvation. That's why the Bible can say that if you're a true Christian, you'll be led by the Spirit. Because every Christian, truly saved Christian, possesses the Spirit. So Peter simply says that the Gentile salvation is true because God who knows everything gives testimony when he gave him the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them. Ephesians 1.13, he says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is proof. The third proof is the cleansing of sin. Look at Acts 15, verse 9 now. Acts 15, verse 9. And he made no distinction between us and them, where it says, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Here again, Peter says, look, if it's not enough that you have past revelation, 
God didn't require circumcision or legalism. If it's not enough that they got the gift of the Holy Spirit, he says, how about this for truth? They were cleansed from sin. Does God cleanse the heart of an unsaved individual? Of course not. The fact that they were purified in their hearts by faith means that faith is enough. What else could there be done except purification? When God takes away sin, that's it. That's the end of the problem. There's nothing else that needs to be accomplished or done or any work that can be done. In fact, adding works to that only adds possibility for sin, for pride, for complications. If God made them holy, that settles it. The debate's done. In Ephesians 1 verse 7, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. God does not cleanse people from sin whose salvation is not legitimate. All those who try a ritual for works, a works-based route for salvation do not in that find cleansing or forgiveness. And that's also true of Judaism. The Jews just kept doing more sacrifice without any relief of their consciences. Christ came along and he clears the conscience. He forgives them. Forgiveness is complete in him. So Peter says, look, they've already been purified by faith. What is law going to add to that? It's all done. Then Peter points out another fantastic piece of evidence that shows that salvation comes by the free grace of God alone. The fourth proof is that the law can't save. Verse 10. It says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? The yoke. Why put a yoke, he says. We haven't been able to handle that thing, that burden of the law. We have failed miserably. Those of us, you and I, I, Peter, and you Pharisees, you Judaizers who love the law, are not able to keep the law, are not able to bear that yoke. Notice he says, why are you putting God to the test? What are you, what are you going to provoke God for? Why do you want to irritate God? God works out a beautiful grace system here of salvation, and you're going to irritate him by trying to stick other things on. Don't challenge God. Don't question God. This is clearly his will. This is clearly what he has been showing us. His decision for salvation is final. Don't test God. Don't put a yoke on the neck of those Gentiles that we couldn't even carry ourselves. The law was a yoke. It was this weight to be carried. A proselyte who came to Judaism was said to take on the yoke of the kingdom of God. The law was, was great, but it was a weighty burden. It was there not to save, but to show us our need for salvation. The law is impossible to carry for those of us who are in sin. Why do you want to put something on them that we can't even carry? That's what he's asking there. In Matthew 23, verse 2, Jesus speaking said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. In verse 4, Jesus continues, he says, They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Jesus is condemning the Pharisees for the very same thinking that's leading to these Judaizers doing this to the Gentiles. They just love to weigh people down with all of the rituals. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is is light. The teaching of the Judaizers is that they were doing that. They were trying to put a burden on the back of Gentiles that they couldn't bear themselves. 
Yet Jesus says his yoke is light. That doesn't mean there won't be suffering. It doesn't mean it's easy to be a follower of Jesus. That's not the point. But when it comes to salvation, that yoke is light. Salvation is free. Salvation is easy, really. It's just a matter of believing and trusting, which is something our heart is our heart wants to do deep within, under that crusty layer of sin and vileness. There's that part of us that longs to come to God and just trust and just believe and just surrender ourselves to that. And it's easy. It's just a matter of faith and belief. That doesn't mean our life after salvation is easy. But again, as we're reminded from Romans chapter 8, all of the trials we face, all of the tribulations, all of the pain and the suffering of this life even that pain, or especially that pain that's caused directly because we've decided to give everything to follow Jesus. All of that is but a momentary affliction. It's but a little prick, a little point in the timeline of eternity. It's nothing. That pain, that suffering, the worst day imaginable we've ever experienced, that is nothing compared to that moment when we see Christ face to face. And in that moment, everything, everything becomes easy. So why impose on pagans that thing that won't work for you? None of these Jews ever got saved by the law. None of them ever got purified by the law. None of them ever received the Holy Spirit because of the law. None of them were ever cleansed by the law. So why impose the law on the Gentiles? Peter says, verse 11, But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. It is by grace. Salvation is by grace. And grace alone. It's easy. And we should never forget that. That salvation is easy, but life is tough. But in the end, it's all worth it. I've got plenty more for today, which means I'll have some more to start us off with next week. I don't want to keep us here uh, too much longer, and I think that's a good place to stop. And so we'll go ahead and close in prayer now. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this rich, dense, delicious text here that we can pull apart, we can examine, we can look at and reflect on and meditate on because there's so many wonderful truths here. Father, I pray that it would never, ever be said of us that we, as a church, ever add any works to salvation. Father, I pray that you would keep that message pure in our hearts. That we might be better equipped to go into this world and to tell people that Jesus will take away the burdens pain, that heavy load that they're bearing because those people who don't know Christ, they're carrying around all of that. They're trying to be better. They think if they can just be the better version of who they are now, that somehow somehow that will save them in the moment, that all of the pain that they're feeling will go away. But Lord, that's not true. It's not just a matter of being a better version of ourselves. It's not just a matter of helping more people through life. It's, it's not just a matter of making more money so that our family is provided for. None of these things save us. They're all just works that our human hearts are longing to do. But Father, I pray that we would be a people that help people come to Christ to find that easy, uh, that load taken away, that the path would be easy for us that we not be weighed down by all those false ideas of what it means to be saved or free or happy in this life, that we would be happy only in Jesus, that he would take those things away from us, that we might have freedom, that these people might have freedom. Father, help us to be ambassadors in our community who have but one message for the world. Salvation is freely given by grace, through our faith in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. Father, we pray these things, we ask these things in his name. Amen.